This is the video for B1.1 on carbohydrates and lipids, and we'll sp focus specifically on lipids. Lipids include a wide variety of molecules, but they are all hydrophobic. So hydro meaning water, phobic meaning hating. These all hate water, and that is because they are nonpolar. So because they are nonpolar, that also means that they are not soluble in water. Some examples of lipids include fats, oils, waxes, and steroids. And as you can see, they have a variety of structures and they're gonna have a variety of functions in cells and in living organisms, but all are hydrophobic. Now, before we talk about how we're going to put different lipid components or triglyceride components together, let's talk about fatty acid structure in general. I think that will help us quite a bit. So what you're gonna see here in fatty acids are these carbon chains, and we're gonna see hydrogens attached to them. And then on either side of the carbon chain, we're going to see a carboxyl group, COOH, and a methyl group, CH3. So even when some of these start to look different, right? Like some are longer, some are shorter, some are bent, some are straight. Don't forget, they all have some things in common, a carbohydrate or sorry, a carbon chain, a carboxyl group and a methyl group on either end. Now, one of the things that I can make with those fatty acids is something called a triglyceride, tri meaning three. So this is the combination of a molecule called glycerol with three fatty acid chains. So here is glycerol right here. It's a three carbon molecule with three anchoring points for those three fatty acids, and you connect the glycerol with the fatty acids using a condensation reaction. So that will form a covalent bond. And again, condensation reactions are the removal of water, H2O, okay, the removal of water molecules. And then this oxygen here will be left to share between the carbon of the glycerol and the carbon of the fatty acid. Now this molecule, this triglyceride, is entirely hydrophobic, which means it's nonpolar and it is not soluble in water. Now one of the things that I can make with those fatty acid chains is something called a triglyceride, and tri means three. This is a molecule that's made up of glycerol, this is what glycerol looks like, and one, two, three fatty acid chains. So one, two, three. And glycerol serves as kind of like an anchor point or an anchor molecule for these three fatty acid chains. We are of course going to connect them or bond them together by removing water in a condensation reaction. So again, H2O is what gets removed, a water molecule, and that leaves this oxygen to be bonded between both of those carbons. And if I do that one, two, three times, and remove three water molecules, I'm going to get something called a triglyceride. Again, that's glycerol with one, two, three fatty acid chains attached. This is entirely hydrophobic, so that's important. This whole molecule, all parts are water hating. And that's going to be very different from phospholipids, which are amphipathic. So amphi, kind of like amphibian, part on land, part on water, means that it has two different parts of its molecule with different properties. So it will have both a hydrophobic region, just like the triglycerides, but it will also have a hydrophilic region. Now you're probably more used to seeing these um, phospholipids drawn like this, right? So we may have seen them in, especially if you've drawn like lipid bilayers or cell membranes already. And this is going to be comprised of glycerol, two fatty acids, and a phosphate group. Okay, so if I were to highlight them for you here, here are these, um, fatty acid tails, they are right here, okay? So those are my two fatty acids. And this glycerol and phosphate group, so those are gonna help form this phosphate head up here. And if I'm looking at that in this molecular diagram, here is that head with the phosphate group and the glycerol and these two fatty acid tails. Now, this is very important because this phosphate head is polar, and that means it's hydrophilic. 
it loves water. And these fatty acid tails are nonpolar and hydrophobic. And so this is one of the reasons why they spontaneously form a bilayer with those two tails, like of two different phospholipids pointing inward towards each other, again, because they're hydrophobic. And that would look something like this. Um, here are those hydrophobic tails facing inwards towards each other and the hydrophilic heads facing outward, um, probably in contact with some kind of watery solution. So again, form and function being very apparent here with these amphipathic phospholipids. Now, in thinking about these fatty acid tails, they aren't all identical. They can come in several different forms. And those are saturated, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. Let's talk about saturated fatty acids first. Saturated fatty acids are going to look something like this one, okay? Well, actually all of these are saturated fatty acid tails, but we'll take a look at this one um, as an example. You are going to notice that it is a straight chain that all of the carbons in the carbon chain are connected by single bonds. And it just so happens to be that they're usually solid at room temperature. So I like to remember my S's here. Saturated fatty acids are connected by single bonds. They are straight and usually solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fatty acids are not going to be straight. They're going to be bent. There's going to be what we call a kink or bend in the chain. And that is due to not having all single bonds, but at least one double bond somewhere in the chain. So this is an example of a monounsaturated fatty acid. It is a fatty acid that has one, mono means one, double bond somewhere in the chain. Now, carbon can only form four bonds. So if two of those bonds are to be bonded with the other adjacent carbon, that means we cannot put another hydrogen here or here. So for example, this carbon already has one, two, three, four bonds. So it looks like I have kind of some empty parking spaces, if you will. Now, these hydrogens are going to repel each other, and since there's no equally repelling force down here, it's going to cause a bend in the chain. That's not as important as just being able to recognize this. When I see a bend in the chain, I want to be thinking unsaturated. You won't necessarily always see these, this double bond. It may not always be zoomed in like this. You may just see a line with a bend in it. So that's again why it's really important to remember that this bend is indicative of a double bond. And so I should be thinking unsaturated. This is a monounsaturated fatty acid. If I were to see something with many kinks in the chain, right? So maybe something more like this. Okay, I would want to be thinking polyunsaturated, right? Many double bonds or more than one double bond in the chain. There are some examples of exceptions because of course, here's a monounsaturated fatty acid, right? It has one double bond, but no kink in the chain. And that's because this is a trans fatty acid. Um, and so just a little bit different. These are on opposite sides of the chain. So equal repelling forces and it straightens it out. But for the most part, if we're thinking about naturally occurring, fatty acids, we want to be thinking about these and I want to look for that kink in the chain. So let's take a little bit deeper dive into that, shall we? So we're going to have what's called cis unsaturated fatty acids and cis means the same or aligned. So these are hydrogen atoms that are aligned on the same side of the chain um, on that spot where there's a double bond. More on that in a second. This is going to be most of our naturally occurring fatty acids, for example, like oils. And when you're looking at the diagram, you'll notice that they have a bend or a kink in the chain, okay? That's going to be very different than the trans fatty acids. So this is when the hydrogen atoms are on the opposite side of the chain, and because of that, it straightens out the chain. 
These are mostly man-made. They're not really naturally occurring. And what it does is it helps to solidify that fatty acid. But on the downside, I mean, it's more stable, which is great for things like food products. But one of the downsides is that there are some health concerns there, especially that they're more easily metabolized into things like cholesterol. So again, we can take a look at that. This would be an example of a cis monounsaturated fatty acid. Again, hydrogen atoms are on the same side and I see that bend in the chain. And this is an example of a trans monounsaturated fatty acid. The hydrogens have been moved to opposite sides of the chain. So let's go back to this concept of triglyceride. So I would take three of those fatty acids, they can be different kinds, and attach them to a glycerol molecule. And I'm going to get this triglyceride. And those are the primary components of a special type of tissue in our body called adipose tissue. Adipose tissue is a fatty tissue. We're gonna find it like underneath of our skin and surrounding our organs. It's not a bad thing. We're supposed to have that, um, although a good balance is the right way to go. Um, but triglycerides are a really great storage uh, molecule and they're super at storing energy, specifically long-term energy. So right in that adipose tissue underneath of our skin, we have a lot of triglycerides and they're really amazing at storing energy for long term because they are very stable. They are not soluble in water, which means they don't affect osmolarity or things like the concentration gradients. And they're very energy dense. So they have nine calories for every gram compared to things like carbohydrates, which only have four calories per gram. So they are excellent, excellent, excellent molecules for energy storage in that adipose tissue. And they're also wonderful for thermal insulation. So here is one of my favorite animals. This is the ringed seal. And the ringed seal lives in a very cold, like Arctic climate. And it has a lot of adipose tissue underneath of its skin. And we call this special type of um, adipose tissue blubber. And this is wonderful because triglycerides are not good at conducting heat. Water is a very good conductor, but not things like triglycerides. So they form kind of a barrier between the body heat in the center of the organism and that cold water on the outside. And they kind of like form this preventative layer, um, which keeps the heat in and causes um, less heat transfer to be happening to the environment. In addition to our adipose tissue right underneath of our skin, we also have triglycerides that surround our organs, and that's really great because they can help absorb shock, which is a good protection. So for example, we have some bones surrounding important organs, but there are others, like think about maybe your kidneys, that don't have a bone surrounding them, so that um, triglyceride or adipose tissue forms an important shock-absorbing barrier there as well. Now we've already talked about the amphipathic properties of phospholipids, right? That hydrophilic and hydrophobic region, which allows them to form a lipid bilayer. Not only is that a good way to compartmentalize a cell, but it can also help determine its permeability or what molecules can pass through the cell membrane and which ones can't. So polar molecules like glucose, let's say, can't get past those hydrophobic tails. Those hydrophobic tails don't like things that are polar or have a charge. But some things like steroids are not polar. They are made of nonpolar lipids. So here's a great example. Um, one of the steroid hormones is called testosterone. Not all steroids are bad. There are actually many that are good, including testosterone. And it is a um, combination of three six-sided rings and one five-sided ring, but it is entirely hydrophobic. It is a hydrophobic lipid-based molecule. And because it's hydrophobic, it can pass straight through that lipid bilayer. Those little hydrophobic tails don't mind it because they're also hydrophobic. And so this has huge implications for how different hormones work in our body. So for things like steroid horm hormones, they can go directly into a cell and we'll find them passing three straight through that lipid bilayer. 
Other hormones like insulin that are not lipid-based cannot pass through that lipid bilayer. And we'll talk about that in another topic, but again, theme B, form and function. Okay, how is this formed? Well, it's hydrophobic lipids, and how does that impact the function? Well, by being able to pass through this membrane. So important to keep your eye on that theme here.